This is our keynote speaker, Greg Lenz. Greg Lenz is the co-host of We Are the Giants with Chris Spangle. I'll let him do his own introduction. All right. <laughs> What's that? He's talking about what we violate the Lord. Well, you got to close the door. Well, not all of you do uh, are familiar with me because you probably don't listen to Libertarian podcasts, so I won't hold that against you. Um, my name's Greg Lenz. I am actually a recent addition to the party. Uh, within about uh, within the last month, I joined the Libertarian Party of Indiana, and it's been it's been incredible. And I was brought in in kind of an odd way. Um, I'm a scumbag Republican past. That's, that's who I used to be. Feel free to tar and feather me. I, I own it. But Chris Spangle, your former executive director, that's actually how most of you know me um, or were introduced to me. And Chris was kind enough about four years ago. He had just left his job as executive director. And it was right after the Rupert campaign, I believe. And he'd started We Are Libertarians. He was looking for content. I had a blog with daily news stories. And even though we'd gone to high school together, we, uh, we didn't talk about politics at all. And sure enough, I got the bug. I mean, I feel like uh, Joe Hopman in 2012 gave a speech at the Libertarian uh, uh, State Convention in Columbus. And in it, he said, we'll never win if we get everybody to turn out. The only way we will win is if we can get the people who are organic libertarians, I believe was your exact phrase, and that has stuck with me for four years, because it's true. <clears throat> I do believe that each one of us are born libertarian. I believe that we don't like to see harm. We don't like to see someone hurt. We don't like to see someone suffer. And that shared human instinct, that shared human bond, is what really separates our political philosophy versus the political philosophies of progressivism, statism, whatever you prefer, where it's top-down tinkering over people and trying to perfect outcomes for others. Rex spoke about the non-aggression principle, and that's something I've battled for a long time as well. I know Austin Peterson's running for uh, to be the presidential nominee for the Libertarian Party, and he doesn't want to take the pledge because he believes that it costs more votes than it gains. And I, I just, I guess I couldn't, uh, I couldn't disagree more. I feel like the non-aggression principle isn't something to be ashamed of. It isn't. I understand the practicality of it in the '70s because you did have anarchists throwing bombs, you had weather underground, go on to become ghostwriters for President Obama, very successful people. <laughs> um, but that was the environment we were in, and it was a pledge to the government: we don't need to be watched. Turns out, though, it's something deeper. The non-aggression principle is something where I, by taking a pledge to this, to Rex or to any of you here tonight or when I joined the party, I'm trusting you. I'm creating a mutual obligation between you and I and a degree of reciprocity that I won't harm you and you won't harm me. And there is an invisible bond that brings us all together in that moment. It's a bond that grows and it's a bond that's slowly been deteriorating, in my opinion, in society for quite some time. When I come in or when I talk about a news issue or the coarsening of our of, uh, basically civic discourse today, it's culminated in Donald Trump. It's culminated in a reality TV star who bashes people because he lacks any policy substance, even though he fills in the gaps with experts to try to justify his beliefs. Donald doesn't think about his policy, he says, what's popular, and I'll go run on it. He's the ultimate demagogue. And it's sad that this is where we are, because it hasn't, I mean, we've always had politics. It's just the way it is. People do negative attacks on each other and say horrible, awful things about each other. It's unfortunate that's successful. I don't know necessarily that that's a good commentary on the human existence, but what I do know is that it's reached a point today where policy is in the background and we attack each other and it's brutal and it's over the internet and it's anonymous and it's made us grow further apart to where these hidden bonds, like the one that's created between <laughs> me taking this pledge with all of you, that is fairly hanging on by a thread. And that's pretty sad because that makes libertarianism really difficult to grow. Trust actually precedes the non-aggression principle. Because if I take this pledge, when I did with you, 
I'm all trusting that that's going to come back to me. Then I take the pledge. Until we create an environment where trust exists, where it grows, and where those invisible bonds are finally readily identifiable to someone who doesn't, you know, maybe not feel comfortable um, becoming a libertarian or pulling the lever in the voting booth, because libertarianism and most of our policy prescriptions are a negation. We say government does these things poorly. We say government does these things in a way that creates more harm than good, even with the best of intents. The problem with it is, though, if you don't give someone else a guarantee or a solution in a world where trust doesn't exist and bonds aren't strong, communal bonds, the only hope they have in a time of need is the government. And so I've always believed that the reason we've seen the growth of the welfare state and social planners and the alienation of neighbor from neighbor, you know, we're in a society where it's, oh, I have to go to work today so that person can watch Jerry Springer. And that's not healthy for anyone. It's alienated man from man. The government via taxation alienates me from the product of my labor because I work till April 15th and I don't even get to keep the results of what I work for. And so in that, I guess the, the question I keep coming back to is how do we all best rebuild these bonds? What do we do in our daily lives that instead of talking about the government did this, this is what they do, repeatedly wrong, we don't have that next logical step to hand it off to, here's what we need to do in order to make a society more fair. And until we do that, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I'm not sure how much we can grow. We've had a very beneficial four years since I began my descent down with Chris, and we are libertarians. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in the best way possible. <laughs> I was so happy when I was a Republican, and I'm just mad. <laughs> no, but as I began my uh, descent into the philosophy, it became pretty clear to me that, man, one, it's incredibly difficult to sell, and it's entirely based on the assumption of implicit trust between individuals in the absence of a safety net, of a hand up, of anything like that. And so until that is addressed, we can't create a society where we can offer policy prescriptions, tell the person, listen, the reality is the Department of Child Services does nothing to help you and only creates a nightmare. When that's the only option for that person because they don't have neighbors that care, a church community that they attend, they have internet friends, Facebook interactions, you know, they know everything about each other's lives, but they don't talk to each other. And that leads to the coarsening of discourse and the disconnect that's resulted to where we are today where no wonder the government's grown. More and more people feel alone, the bonds are frayed, the social fabric is, you know, barely hanging on. All too often America is referred to as a melting pot, and that isn't true. What America is, is a patched quilt where there's a social fabric that bonds very distinct patches into one common unit. And I say that of the world as well, but I tend to think, oh, I'm a scumbag Republican, I tend to think as a nationalist, but you know, I work on that. I work on that and seeing the world that way. And so as we address these things and rebuild the social fabric, the only way that any of us can do it and make an impact is small acts of kindness. It's going over and helping your neighbor fix their tire. It's when you're na you see a single mom, she's got three kids, she works two jobs, she can't afford a babysitter, you just go over and say, hey, don't worry about it, I got it today. And as those little acts compound and things grow, we will create these elements of trust and we'll start to show people that there are bonds. There, are, there is an element of reciprocity in the human existence that'll serve as the platform for our libertarian solutions. Because then at that point it won't be, well, dang, I'm negative in my checking account, credit cards are max, I might as well go get food stamps. It'll be, hey, Jim, here's what's going on in my financial life. This is the issue, I had a major expense I couldn't handle, and three neighbors show up with groceries and stock it, and there's no room for the government to come in and interject. And when we do that and we establish this element of trust, I don't think there's anything that can stop us. We've had a good run, 
Police brutality has been very popular in the press. That aided our cause. Libertarianism has never been more popular. It's completely, I guess, infected the American lexicon. Um, I just think that we have gotten lucky, and I say that horribly because it's been a loss of human life and liberty, but the last four years have been conducive to our growth, and that's not a guarantee the next four will. The next four could be 9-11, and all liberty and gains we made are lost. There's just no telling what major events will or will not help us grow. We had Edward Snowden. We had uh, Ferguson, Baltimore, Chris Garner. Those are all things that are our cause. I mean, Rand Paul jumped from an ophthalmologist, first-term senator, all the way to the cover of Time Magazine as the most interesting Republican because he filibustered President Obama's killings of Anwar al-Awlaki and his son, who were just, they, were they terrorists? I don't know. But I do know that they were American citizens and regardless of whether or not they had pledged anything to anybody, they're entitled to due process. Those are all things libertarians can seize upon. And if we don't get that type of news cycle the next four years, I don't want to see things fall apart. So I'm going to leave you with just this thought, is that every, every small act of human kindness that anyone in this room does, in time, will compound and will make each one of our jobs, the jobs of Lucy, Jim, Rex, everyone, Brett, everyone running in politics as a libertarian who is already at a disadvantage because they're selling no, it's going to give them a huge head start they haven't had. And when that's accomplished, we'll finally be able to control our own destinies and not rely upon the context of which it's built right now. So thank you all for letting me speak to you, and uh, great convention. April 18th, Chris Fangle has a live podcast at Morty's Comic Con. <laughs> 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 <laughs>